to build a little new direction to the project. Uh, it is an arts and communities project rethinking Asian American wellness and unwellness. Um, it has multiple parts, but the, the point of the project, it's called Open Emergency because we think of life as actually always an emergency, a crisis of mental health. We're all going through fucked up shit all the time, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we engage um, our own suffering? And how do we think about strategies of survival that come out of the community? <clears throat> um, and that sometimes intersect with the, the mental health industry and psychology, um, but sometimes are also in excess of, exceed that, right? We, we have mental health and wellness strategies that bubble up out of our own communities that work with, but sometimes against, um, normative understandings of how we should approach mental health. And so the project tries to explore uh, what mental health can look like if we open it up via an arts project. Um, there's multiple parts of the issue, and one that we'll highlight tonight is a tarot deck that we created, where we took the, uh, are we familiar with tarot? Some people here are. Um, so uh, a deck of cards um, with archetypes on them that are used, or, in the last few centuries used for divination or fortune telling purposes. <clears throat> and so as editor, I decided that we should create a deck by and for Asian Americans to try to capture the forces that shape Asian American life. And so we renamed um, all the figures or most of the figures in the deck. And then we had um, artists render them visually and then writers write text on the back of the tarot cards. So you can see here, this is the image, the name, and then the text to kind of theorize what the card is about. Um, but also, we wanted these cards not, to, not just to be art pieces, but to be usable in practices, to create a wellness practice. So the cards also give you instructions about uh, how to use this card, or what to think about or reflect on in your life if you draw the card. We wanted to try to create wellness practices from the ground up. So tonight, we'll highlight these. Um, each of us contributed uh, to one or two cards in the deck. We'll read from our cards, um, and then we'll actually also do some tarot readings for volunteers in the audience, um, which I think will be really fun. <laughs> yeah, some of you look like <gasps> scared already. <laughs> It'll be fun, intimate, but fun. Um, and then we'll just have a kind of general discussion about mental health and about the other parts of the project if you're interested. And then we have you know copies of the project in the back you can look at. Um, tarot decks to look through and to, and to purchase, okay? So we're gonna start with, um, Wo, right? Okay. Hi everybody, um, I'm Wo Chan, I'm a poet, I'm a performer, and I was tasked with writing the text for The Lovers, art by Monica Ramos, really beautiful, two figures. Um, so I'll read the text right now and then talk a little bit more about uh, kind of my own experience trying to figure out what this card meant. The Lovers is the fourth card in the Major Arcana. Often associated with romantic partnership, The Lovers indicates duality and even multiplicity. In times of high stress, the card can also suggest fracturing, spiritually, emotionally, or physically under the weight of what counts as love, who counts as lovers. And the image of the lovers embrace represents self-healing, a rejoining of pieces through nurturance. The figures androgynous silhouetted or walking on water, though its surface is not frozen. It is a perfect reflection of the sky. The lovers are figures contained between worlds. Each holds one end of a cloth, their shared traumas. Their eyes do not meet, their averted gaze an act of trust. One follows the other through the intuition of the body, feeling the taut and slack of the cloth between them. And if one pair of eyes were to look up or down, the faith of their suspended world would collapse. Their bodies would fall through water and sky. We are forces moving together through the interconnectedness of traumas. Traumas between two people, many peoples, or the self and an inner child. The lovers urges you to examine the space you hold for the ones you care for, the self included, and how the intuition of the body and contemplation of care can bring you to pr a practice of love with no impulse to possess. So that's the lovers. Um, yeah, when I was asked to write this card, I was like, wow, you know, I'm, like my tenure on love has like not been spectacular. <laughs> so I was just like, why did you pick me? And so um, the two things that kind of have like, like the two characters that have been kind of sitting on my mental health 
um, as a young uh, 20-something when I was started writing this was that um, my family has been, it's resolved now, but they, they were in deportation proceedings um, for like many years since like I was 19 up until last year. And um, all the while I was like in college and young in New York and trying to date. And um, I, what I noticed was that the accumulation of heartbreaks kind of sat in the same place of like state trauma. It's like, it's so stupid, mm. right? It's like the US is rejecting you. This is a form of like the biggest identity heartbreak. And then some boy won't re return my text and like, ah, oh, I'm just as hurt. Like it sits in the same space mm -hmm. and it's so silly. Um, but those things just kind of added on top of each other and um, became, became cyclical and I felt that I wasn't taking care of myself in the way that like I really needed to be taken care of because you know not everyone has to deal with like fighting the state or being ejected so I didn't really have a model or a guide to like um, make sure that I was okay in, in like doing the dumb like sex in the city dating life but <laughs> um, so yeah I just I, f I thought hard about kind of, uh, and I'm a Scorpio, so like Ooh. the the yeah, line, to, yeah, 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 the line about like <laughs> to possess or um, yeah, it just made it made me kind of figure out like what are the what are the dark sides of like what I consider to be my own impulse to love or um, so I have to examine that. I've been writing. I'm gonna read some poems huh? along those lines. Um, I write poems about nature, like addressed to nature, but they're not really up to nature, they're to um, any large system of power that you find yourself negotiating within. Um, so this is, these are my at nature poems, but they're really kind of like against the state, against uh, any, yeah, any of those gargantuan things. So I'm gonna read a couple of these uh, that I feel are relevant to um, navigating what one may call love. <laughs> At nature, you are loved. Ready for the fall of man, I waste my energy, dreams, that ecological giving way to the wetter world. Person is awake, make a fist. It's time to feel real, time to inculcate a sawtoothed politic. Orchids recently imported learn to live neighborly by that bread muncher staunch at the window frame learn to live a restructured, buttery life. Sunward with the petals of a human tongue and the mouth of each stranger could hurt you by its incredulous warmth. Why they don't never feel the right to be here? Never feel celebratory. Not once up for the reenactment. Not the same luridity. Sometimes my body feels like outdoor furniture someone secretly loosened all the screws to overnight. I will win the awards for work that is meant to exclude. You, the experiment, is to set a shaken, the mind's dry iris. Believe you have more to believe in, and less of which you are certain. The sky is blue, or as you're right, could crack and drag cruelty across the domestic skin. I would craft the replica glass eyeball of each ex-president to fill your bathtub blue. Good mother, this is how you know. Nights, I go pre-verbal, want to be held at bay where, gosh darn, I'm a sorrow process. Don't be so sentimental, we all lose things. Regard the parts of us that touch the air, the parts of us unleavened by salt. It can be extraordinary that some things hold. Example, water is wet like most things are. I opened my mouth to tell you everything I did not need to know about myself. So rimless, as a child I wanted a future earth where I could be loved repeatedly if not boredly, this earth to be crowned with fish and falling fire, its mighty caverns that make the skein of stars itself a roof. You say, look at those flowers. They look sad. I say, flowers don't have feelings. And also, do you want to talk? Lying anywhere on our backs, the earth is cold. 
water is wet, as am I. I do love us. Am I water? All right, so I'm Tani, and I wrote two cards, uh, The Survivor and The Fool. And I am both of these things, so I wanted these cards. <laughs> I asked for the cards that I got. So I definitely wanted to talk about the two kind of, it's not really, a, it's a continuum. I feel like the tarot is a journey of the fool. So the fool is the card that symbolizes the beginning of the journey that we go on as humans trying to navigate life. So I wanted this card because as you see, there's a young brown woman about to jump off a cliff and I'm just like very moved by the image that was created. So I'm gonna read you this and then we can talk about it and then I'm gonna read you the other one and we'll talk about it and then we'll be back. So the Fool is the eighth card in the Major Arcana. This card is the embodiment of spontaneous abandon. The Fool is ready to begin a new journey leaving behind an old world in exchange for one that is uncharted. At times, the fool may seem naive or a bit out of their element. Yet in reality, this is a time to clear the slate to see the entire world. By crossing oceans or taking flight from one end of the world to another, the fool is ready to make seismic shifts. It may be overwhelming. There's a sense of fear of taking risks or being rejected. There's a fear of falling flat on your face. Sometimes a fall is exactly what you need. Remember, as you chart your course, there are no outside forces that can limit you. There are outside forces beyond your control and systems in place that will deny you your freedoms, your ability to be completely free. Yet this is the time to be open and unafraid. It's necessary for your survival. The fool is a reminder to bring your childlike imagination to any new path that beckons you. It is a card of risk and all of the joys that come from breaking out of the humdrum. Let this card invite multitudes into your life, for that is the singular joy of being the fool. Okay, so that is the fool. And I love the fool because it's very scary to start a new journey in any capacity. If it's a new gig, if it's a new art form, if it's a new relationship. I mean, this is all really scary shit. So the fool is really our guide in telling us that you are going to make a fool out of yourself and that's part of the beauty of the experience of being the fool so it's a good thing and there's so much judgment laced into taking a risk or experiencing the world so i really wanted to explore how the fool is a symbol of our childlike abandon that you really need to be an artist i mean you can never let go of that so you're going to be a hot mess to some people but that is exactly what's going to drive you to write or whatever it is that you're doing um, on a more, I guess, you know, uh, what would the word be, elusive note, the survivor card, this is not in the traditional deck, which I thought was really cool because it's a mix. This deck is not really the traditional arcana of the tarot. The things aren't ordered in the traditional sense. So the Fool is what the, you know, Rider Waite or Marseille deck are based on is the Fool's journey, but this is a new card. And I felt like that was really interesting because it's like the Asian American deck, right? So being Asian American or being any hyphenated American in any capacity, I think that a lot of just trying to get up in the morning and trying to like love yourself from head to toe, get on with your day and be seen in the world is an act of survivorship. Mm -hmm. And that very act of just being like, I fucking matter and my work matters and like no one knows my name and no one knows how to say my fucking name, like all that stuff that we deal with, like it's just, it, it kind of batters you down despite all the stuff you're going through like with your family and your lovers and your friends and your children and everything. I mean, that's all even deeper than just our own reckoning with ourselves is how we relate to the world around us. So I really wanted to create a card that talks about survivorship in that way, but also survivorship with what we're all talking about, which is like violence against our bodies because of our gender, because of our sexuality, because of our just being in the world and being seen as vulnerable and being raped and traumatized and abused by that. So I really wanted to like go into that definition as well. I didn't want to just be like, we're surviving our immigrant life. You know, it's like, yes, we are. But a lot of that has been, don't talk about shit. Don't tell people you're weak. Don't talk about how you're hurting and you're upset. And that's part of this great shame and responsibility we carry. As I mean, I'm a second generation person, child of immigrants. I'm not an immigrant. 
So it's a very different thing when you're dealing with deportation. And I mean, that's all just trying to survive. I really appreciate you sharing that too, actually. So I'm going to read from this card as well. The survivor is the 14th card in the Major Arcana. She is often depicted as a shadow walking away from a pyre of ashes, the mm -hmm. remnants of a bonfire on the beach. She emerges from the sands exposed by a waning tide. She feels the hands that once hurt her, told her that she was unworthy, tried to drown her in pain that was not hers. She is adorned in scars that are always healing, never vanishing. The stigma of being an outsider, of being wayward or taking life into your own hands has taken its toll on you. You've been through so much already. The situation at hand may seem impossible, but you have the ability to transform it to conspire in your favor. Now is the time to reap the fruits of your emotional labor. It's time to walk away from the shackling hands of the past. It's time to realize that your pain isn't your identity, but a vestige of you as a victim. You carry the memories and histories of your people. They survived too. The survivor card calls upon us to remember what made us who we are, however hard or ugly, and carry that into our futures. There is a beautiful power in our vulnerability. Let your heart do the heavy lifting and let it lead you. Thank you. That's pretty much the two cards that I wanted to, well, that I wrote. I didn't write all the cards, just those two. But I wanted to kind of, you know, I guess we'll have time to talk with you after. But I think that um, what I love about the deck that you guys kind of brought all of us together to make is that, like, we're not just one identity. We're all these multitudes mm -hmm. of identities. And it's not like... There's so much pressure in perfection. There's so much pressure in failure. There's so much pressure. There's so much pressure to be, and it's like we're all of these things. It's like an infinite experience in this deck, and I think that's part of why I was so excited to be a part of it. Is like, you know, we're the shopkeeper, and we're the survivor, and we're the lover, and we're the lech. I mean, we're all the fucking things in the world. But so often, when you are coming from a certain experience, you're not allowed to be that. You're just what people want you to be. And I think that's why we need these little like talismans or blessings as we were talking about. We need that. And I think that that really gives us that sense of that in the deck. So thank you. Thank you. Let's give a hand to that. <laughs> so um, I'm going to read a card uh, that I co-wrote with my partner, Lawrence Mimbu Davis, who's right here. Um, <laughs> That actually goes with Thani's uh, survivor card. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so some of the cards we kind of thought of in pairs or together, linking them. And so this one's called the Lecher, mm -hmm. also known as the perpetrator or the rapist. Mm -hmm. The Lecher is the 13th card in the major arcana. Picture him a destroyer. But remember, he is our uncle, our cousin, our holy man, our child. Sometimes mistaken for a lone monster, he is a fixture of every family portrait, every community charter. Yes, the expressions on faces demand exegesis. Do not read them. The atmosphere is what matters. We use expressions to inflect the immaterial, but the real medium is space itself. Look at the forest. Predation is always near us, and not simply in the tremulous body of the predator, but in the forest that teaches him to hunt, a forest we tend together with sacrifice and debt, a forest we keep quiet together to safeguard our communal vulnerability. Take a breath. Outrage blinds us to our complicity. Outrage styles itself a solution we must know is no solution. The lecher reminds us that outrage is wind, not air. It reminds us to look not around the corner, but in that heaviness that binds our limbs, our spirits, that poisonous silk threaded in our every connection. Trace the fine lines. Fine where they loop and not around you, in you, where they cut into soft flesh, strangle, sever. Untie, unweave as fast as you can. Allow yourself to grieve what has been lost. Care for the survivor. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our, our thinking behind this card, but I also kind of just want to leave it uh, kind of related to what Thani was saying about 
all of us being survivors mm -hmm. in, in various ways as we engage different forms of violence in our lives. Um, this card is also about all of us being a part of the problem of violence and our different mm -hmm. ways of participating in violence. And we want to think about especially sexual violence as uh, particular monsters uh, instead of thinking about the community um, as actual incubators mm -hmm. of violence um, and related to the kind of silence that you're talking about. Uh, and so I want, we, we wanted this card to try to think about um, sexual violence in the context of communities, communities of color facing their own kinds of violences and vulnerabilities, uh, and then what are our responsibilities because of our complicities and our roles in that, even if we ourselves do not see, see ourselves as predators. Um, and then the picture uh, on the card uh, is by um, Monica Ong, and it is a family portrait. And there's one face kind of blown up, and then lines connecting to other figures. And so we're left to interpret it, what, the, what those lines mean. Um, are those relationships or connections of violence? Are those connections of intimacy and love? Are they both, maybe? Um, I think I was going to read another card, but I think I'll leave it at that. And then we're going to move into uh, the readings. tarot Watch. readings for <laughs> anyone who wants to volunteer. Or maybe we'll have like two or three people if people want to do that. And then we'll have a QA and a and have an open discussion about the project. Okay. okay? Does any, has anyone ever gotten a tarot card reading before? Yeah? Ooh, okay. Some yeah. of you. Okay. I was like, like yes. yes. Um, did you like the experience or was it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well. I'll be doing the reading, right? Yes. Are you reading? No, go ahead. For people? You do the reading. I'll be doing the reading, um, and I do tarot card readings. Like I actually use tarot card decks. I'm a professional reader. Um, I've read for Rick Ross and Kanye West. Wow. Yeah. Really? Are you joking? I'm not joking. Um, this is when I was like in my 20s when you do fun things like that. I mean, now I'm literally making candles in my house. Uh, so yeah, I. Don't drop names. I'm just being funny. It doesn't matter. Those people don't. Get a reading from someone who gave Kanye West a reading. I don't know why I'm, Please don't use this video. <laughs> um, but anyway, just to say that. But he that, didn't get a reading with his deck. So yeah. This, this is a de this special deck experience. Is special. So if you want to do a reading. Um, let's have know, a volunteer come up. Let's Somebody have volunteer. someone. Okay. Yeah. Yay, come up, come up. So I'm going to give you my seat so you can sit here and do the reading with me. Hi. What's your name? Camera. Camera. Nice to meet you, Thani. Uh, I was like, I was going to put your Okay, awesome. So this is a little bit different because usually this side is like a design, yeah. right? So don't read this side. And I'm going to like use this reading a little bit to guide the thing, but I want to also interpret it. Okay, so just shuffle the deck. Um, and as you're shuffling, I kind of um, like to tell people, think of something that sort of needs illumination in your life. So if you need clarity on something, and the way that tarot works, and don't if- watch me shuffle. No, I won't, don't. Um, <laughs> just like, <laughs> but basically the thing that I like to tell people is that I'm not a psychic, and I'm definitely not going to like predict something terrible for you, but it's really like what is in your heart that you need illumination about, and I'm here to guide you by illuminating that for you. So it's really clarity and, and finding your purpose within a situation, not so much like you're gonna die. <laughs> this is like a terrible card to get. But it's you are like gonna that. die. We are gonna, gonna, gonna die. die. Everyone's gonna die. Yeah, it's guaranteed. Okay. Let's be clear. All right. So I want you to again don't look at these words. <laughs> and just choose one card. We're gonna do one card reading from anywhere in this deck, whatever calls to you. This one? Okay, got it. So, she picked the refugee. Mm -hmm. the, the issue, I'm oh, sorry, it's like, can you see this? Okay, so here, why don't you look at the card too since you picked it. All right, so I will start by reading what's on the card because I think it is important to honor Mimi T. Wynn. I don't know her personally. Is she in here? No. She's not here. Okay, um, but the refugee, wow. A beautiful card. 
Okay, so I think that this card also, I mean, you should all look at the deck afterward, but isn't this an amazing card? It's very it's complicated. I feel like you're really a complicated good. young person. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you complicated? <laughs> no judgment, I'm complicated too. Okay, so floating on the ocean's changing currents, the refugee imparts strength to those living with uncertainty. The plant in the refugee's hands is emblematic of a treasured home, but also the groundlessness of new beginnings. The refugee symbolizes the present as a passage through simultaneously felt pasts and futures. In a reading, the refugee can signal a crisis requiring intervention. But while crisis might intensify a catastrophic event, this danger might well be an ongoing condition or structure. The obstacles presented on the card are scenes of misplaced faith. Both the wall and the helicopter stand for outside forces that aim to regulate your movement, but they might also represent your own attachments to enclosure or rescue or another's power. The refugee can be a warning that what, what appears to be a gift might be the imposition, imposition of a debt, and what is heralded as resilience might be the imposition of responsibility for a crisis not of one's making. The refugee warns that while crisis might describe the limits of a condition or structure, even a habit of being in the world, the desire for security and protection can also recruit control or even submission. The refugee urges you to examine your objects of desire and how their promises have brought you before obstacles to your own flourishing. So it's a lot of dense text, so you should read this again, but I think I'd like to interpret it for you. So I think that we need to think of the word refugee as a thing with multiple meanings. And I think that we're very much in a time where people are without a home and like landless people, people living on the sea, people living like strangers in the land that they grew up in, that generations of their family have grown up in. And you don't feel like you have a place to be rooted and grounding yourself. And that feeling, by picking this card, the deck is telling you that that feeling is very present in how you're operating in the world, whether it's with a lover or your friends or your identity as a woman that you are, as a person that you are, it is embedded in that experience of feeling like you don't have a thing to latch onto, a place to latch onto. Now, this card is also, in a sense, uplifting, I think, because it's saying that that's also in our mind. There's a certain level of power that we give to being, you know, submitting to a power or a structure that exists but you're obviously beyond any power or structure that could exist. And like that is part of the beauty of being a refugee is to be a person that can go into this land or that land or this part of the imagination or this part of the world and there's nothing actually fettering you or holding you because you're in movement and you're actually trying to you know, be liberated from the things that hold you down, whether structural or whether in your own psyche. So there's this kind of movement, I think, attached to being the refugee that is very, um, I think, frightening and intense, but also liberating to know that, like, you know what, this isn't home, but I'm going to make fucking home wherever I go, and I'm going to be home wherever I go. And I think that's, like, this card is really speaking to me in that way. So I don't know if that resonates for you, but I yeah. definitely, yeah, okay. The whole, like, the whole thing. The description and your interpretation, I'm like, wow, drag me. <laughs> um, but drag you through like, to get drag you through <laughs> to get to something new is yeah it's a good drag because it's like you know I think I was like um, but that's the thing it's like the, it's you're we're we're wearing the weight of so much right and it's just race, class, gender, sexuality, just every part of our identities is really loaded with so much. So in that, it's like there is a part of us that yearns for a sense of just oneness with something that's greater than all of those things. It's just you, you know, like Cameron, as you, just you the person. And I think that's what this card is saying is like don't necessarily get stuck in that feeling of being a refugee in those different spaces in your world. It's a moving identity. So that is my interpretation. You can look at the card. <coughs> cool. Anyone have questions? Oh, you. she's like, I want to get a reading. Do you want to get a reading? Yeah. OK, cool. All right. Thank you. Yay.
scary to get a public reading. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, this is like a lot. Um, right? It's like, but yeah, come on up. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. But people are still excited like, to come up. This so is like it's like next okay. level talk show. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, who's up next like, I for the. I just want to jump on this chair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, all right, so you saw how it was done. So I'm just going to put the refugee back in here. Um, so just, again, shuffle the deck and don't look at the words because then it's not fun to know what you're getting. <laughs> okay. And then you can just pick any card from this deck. All right. The ancestor. All right. This is the ancestor. I don't know. This I feel like a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> just like, <laughs> like I, I don't understand. Baron Steve Bears. Okay. So this is a photo <laughs> of a grandmother and a child and a heart. So you can look at that image. Nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, they're all gorgeous. You should buy this deck. Okay, so <laughs> the ancestor. Sometimes mistaken as purely familial, the ancestor is one of the imagination, but the historical one. Nearing the halfway point in the major arcana, the ancestor symbolizes chiasmus one. What is that? Chiasmus. Like chiasmus, yeah, crosser. I was like, wow, I haven't said that word since college. <laughs> Because I'm not an academic anymore. <laughs> Never mind that. Thank you. Whoa, well, do you want to explain Kaiazma's crossing just over? Crossover, yeah. Crossover. It's like a K pop dance move. Um, yeah, <laughs> crossover. Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> the Kaiazma's one. Ten. I was like, is that an identity? <laughs> um, so the crossing over that one tends to make between past and present when one makes sense of history. In the lower half, there is a heart. Its bloodlines look like a nest and its shape a bird itself. The heart symbolizes nothing but the heart. Systole, diastole, ventricle, aorta. Note the position of the nest, especially in relation to the birds. They work on different planes. The human history one seeks so ardently to see in nature can only come perpendicular to the animist world. The card's lesson is that a human life is nothing but a bundle of tails. Those who seek wise words from the ancestor should, should first cover your left ear with your left hand and right eye with your right while recounting a story about an ancestor you have never met. Then cover your right ear with your left hand and your left eye with your right. I, we should do, you should be doing this. Okay. <laughs> while recounting a story from an ancestor you have met. Finally, mm -hmm. hold your tongue with both hands while improvising a story that incorporates an object from each of the above stories. One has become you, um, by Ger Gerald Ma. Um, that's cool, that's like an interactive card. <laughs> okay, so you can try that as well, the, the hand thing. But I think the way that I would interpret the ancestor, I feel like the pressure that I was talking about is really connected to being the first of your kind. What does it mean to be the first of your kind? Even though you come from the body of one, who comes from the body of one, who comes from the, you're coming from a lineage of people who have struggled and suffered and done everything to give us, us, the collective us, the life, like the life that we have. But in that, you yearn to find your individuality and your strength. And in that process, sometimes we forget the ancestor. And that's not to say that like, we want to be like coddled by this, you know, the giants of the past and be under their shadow. But it's really to say that you need to understand that your ancestors are not just the ones that you've inherited through blood, is that your ancestors are part of the collective of human history that give you the power to become the person that you are, but you're still an individual who's still the first of her kind in that process of being the ancestor. So you have this power that comes to you, but it's not manifest in the same way. I mean, I think the image says a lot. It's like this nest that they're building right here, that is not only a symbol of the home and family and all those literal messages, it's all the, so the thing that you're kind of feeling, your lifeblood that you're feeling within you that empowers you, that gives you a purpose, that gives you a legacy. And I really think of art making, you know, like why do we write, why do we make art? And I question this every day, like why the fuck am I here, what am I doing? It doesn't matter. And I think that that's like the thing that really keeps us from 
not only channeling our ancestors, but it keeps us from growing in the ways that we need to grow. And this card is really saying, whatever you make in the world will last forever to the people that will never know you and the people who know you mm. and who you are in the world comes from people who know you and made you and people who will never know you and you will never ever get to see or be around, but they have made you. That is why you are here. And to know that there's like that feeling of constantly experiencing the lives of your ancestors through what you're doing, you can better create and connect to the person that you are right now. Cool. That's great. <laughs> I think it's, I think the ancestor card too, it's like, you're very, you know, it, it's an, not, in, it's like, it's hard to not feel indebted to that, but it's also like empowering to realize like, that is what we all come from, is the experiences of another time. I mean, I think about being, like I identify as a woman and I'm like the things that I'm experiencing now, like the way that I live my life now is so different from my grandmother who was 13 when she got married. My great grandmother who was nine when she got married. I mean, these are just a generation, you know, two generations ago. So it's like the way that our history is propelling us forward. There's this legacy of struggle and survivorship and, you know, just living that has allowed you to be where you are today. That's what you come from. Cool. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Rick Ross did not deserve you. Rick Ross did not deserve you. I don't think he. I just. Yeah. Too brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Yeah, I like reading cards. I think we have a few minutes for some questions and open discussion, either responses to what you just saw or any particular cards or about the project. As a whole, there was a hand. Oh no, I thought you wanted any other volunteers. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Skype, Skype. Skype, yeah, right. Just, just pay pal me after. No kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> Does anyone have questions for us? Or? Sure. Sure. Have these cards been translated in any? Ooh, that's no, a great they question. have not yet been translated. So this project was just published in um, January this year. Yes, I have not thought about a translation project. That would be interesting. That would be so many decks. <laughs> Asian American literature. That would be a lot of languages. <laughs> like so many decks. That's cool. Yeah, yes. really cool. Oh, like it's up to you if you want to answer or not. But I just would want to question, like, what drew you to mental health specifically? Mm -hmm. From like a walk of your life, like, what specifically drew you to kind of focus on and make sure other people were aware of in a performance or in a written yeah, form yeah. why mental health was important. Yeah, for me. Um, so I'm a survivor of postpartum depression. So my daughter's six now, and during her first year, um, I had, I kind of self-diagnosed as having PPD. I was really fucking miserable. And I was like, motherhood is hard and awful, and why is it so hard and awful? And I found, as I was struggling with my own mental health, that the uh, narratives available to me to explain my experience were not very helpful. They actually just blamed me. Mm. Right? They were like, you just need to work harder. Or isn't it all worth it? Isn't your child making it? No. 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 It doesn't. It's not. <laughs> I need to fucking sleep. Right? Like, no. <laughs> and so I found that mental health language um, wasn't, didn't have the capacity, the current language that I was having access to, didn't have the capacity to understand the pressures of motherhood. And so I reached elsewhere to start thinking about my own mental health. And I came up with, um, you know, my, my background is in Asian American studies. Um, that I reached into areas of kind of cultural narratives around the super mom in you know American motherhood, thinking about Asian American pressures to be the mono minority, and then for myself as a Vietnamese American, thinking about um, post-war ideas about resilience. How as refugees we need to all be resilient and like you know we survive war. What is so hard about being a mom, right? Like, and so those kinds of ideas about strength, will, power, and I felt those contributed so greatly to my own mm. mental unwellness that explained it much better than chemical imbalance could ever explain mm -hmm. it for me. And so I started exploring what are ways that we can develop as a community to think about the things that we suffer from mm. as a community, right? And so the question became, became not are we ill or are we well, but what hurts, 
and how do we think about why that's hurting and then how do we address those hurts in our community. And then also I'm a uh, professor I teach and I found that my students disclose a whole lot of mm -hmm. shit. Like they are suffering and dealing with a lot of shit. Mm -hmm. And so I started teaching mental health, working it into my classrooms and finding them starving for that conversation. You know, Asian American students have the highest rates of suicidal ideation on college campuses. Like the stats help us understand that but don't really help us understand why and the depth of it and what it looks like. And I found that bubbling up in my classroom. So that intersected with my own experience. So that's how I started doing this project. Do you want, do you want us to tell me? Should, should sure, I, yeah, I'll, to, I'll yeah. jump in. Um, so I have just completely experienced this as a writer, but as a person too, I'm a survivor of rape. And it's been many years, 20 years. I'm not thinking about it every day in that way that I did 20 years ago. Um, but it's not something I told my mom until like five years ago. And she read it in an essay that I wrote that I never thought she would read because my sister like liked it on Facebook and it popped up on her feet. It was like Damn one of those sister. social media, like, no, <laughs> I was so good at holding it. And she was really devastated. I mean, she was like, I failed you. All I did was want to protect you. I wanted to be there for you. And the same like conversation of like, why did you go to that person's house? Why did you, you know, all mm. the shit that, you know, your Asian mom is going to say to you. She said it all. <laughs> like, you know, I'm 30 and I'm like, oh God, I don't want to talk about this. But it really like opened this, like, you know, the, I don't know, we crossed the chiasmus. <laughs> We've crossed over into this like new part of our relationship because then she was disclosing her sh shit and mm -hmm. my auntie's shit and my sister. We're all dealing with our shit. And I think that because we come from these peoples who are so aware of how they appear to the world outside mm -hmm. because it's weak to be weak and it's like, you know, you're it's crazy dangerous. if you have it's dangerous. It's just, I see, I've been seeing a therapist for 10 years. It's weak to do that. You know, why do you need that? It costs so much money. All these things, I feel like we just don't talk about it. And it's literally like, I'm just going to like bottle it up and be really strong. But when that happened to me, I was kind of like, you know what? Fuck it. You know. And now that you know, I'm going to write whatever the fuck I want and I don't care about it. You know, and it's like really, it really hit me in this way that I'm like, this isn't just for me, you know, and like every time I write about something that's related to assault or survivorship, I kind of check in with her because it's her mental health. I don't want her to feel like traumatized every time she's reading something I've written. But, um, you know, she'll share that with her, she's a blogger, but she'll be sharing it with her Bangladeshi women's blogger groups, and then they're all disclosing their own stories. So it's like this one, like, path that you're opening for conversation, as we're seeing now, very much in the world, it's like, it just, it's all there, you know? So how can we extract mental health as different from just our health? You know, it is our health to have our mental health. And if you don't have your mental health, you don't feel healthy, you don't feel alive you don't feel good in your day to day. So I'm very much always thinking about that in my work. Mm. Well, I was, I was brought on to this project to write a card. Um, and I think at the time I was, I was fighting deportation and I, didn't, I wasn't actively thinking a lot about mental health, but it had taken a big toll on um, kind of like as a young person trying to, to work in the city and make art. Um, that was always, you know, that sits in your mind uh, if you're lucky for a long time, um, if you're unlucky in deportation processes, then you don't really even get a trial and you're like immediately kicked out of the country. But if you have the money to sustain a long fight, which uh, my Asian American community helped me raise, um, like did a huge fundraiser and raised like $20,000, had none of that money, but I needed a, a special attorney for my family. But I, I, think, I think as a young person, I was kind of the only person in my family that spoke enough English to handle this. And I had to like, on top of like, uh, navigating my queerness and like all these things around my family, I had to kind of just be like, look mom and dad, like you have to trust me on this. Like we have to do these things. And I had to like, just put on this stone face to be, um, to handle essentially like, um, the violence of paperwork, right? Like yeah, it's so, totally. it's so mundane, but now yeah. I, I can't like look at a form without just being like, really like, um, triggered by triggered by paperwork right it's it's like funny but it's like 
so real too. It's like I, I refuse. Like I, I just get so tired looking at paperwork now. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was. It. I think it was very lucky that I was asked to participate in this and be asked to fold it and be folded into the conversation. Um, it's nice to know that other people are thinking about these things, even when I don't have the capacity to to process like what has happened to me. I remember, gosh, like one of the most messed up times was uh, I had to go through my entire family's um, every piece of documented history of like every apartment my my dad has been in, you know, like the exact amount of money he had when he came to the U.S. and I had to like go through his entire FOIA. And I remember just like walking up to his first apartment in New York. That, you know, like, like Asian parents don't tell you anything, right? They're like, I came here, we did the restaurant, like <laughs> you're fed. Um, I won't talk, like, but it's partially because they don't want to talk about their traumas, right? So I had to like trace, I, like walked on Bayard Street and just like collapsed against the gate crying because oh. it was exactly like, you know, like 30 years ago, my father lived here and like he never told me yeah. and I worked like five minutes from the spot and it was like no one, like the deportation process, it's so wacky because it's like you can't look at other people's faces and know that they're going through the same thing, right? It's like I can see other Asian American people, but I don't know who is undocumented. I don't know if they can uh, relate to me. So it becomes one of the most isolating, isolating traumas that you can actually experience because it's like, you know, it's dangerous to come out as undocumented, right? So, yeah, it's, I'm still processing a lot of what happened to me and my family, but like, it's, it's such a, the, I think the trauma is so complex and, and not, uh, yeah, it's so complex and like, um, I'm still watching it unfold in my mind as I think about it. <laughs> like, what, it, what does it mean for like my identity when I thought of myself as an American and suddenly am and no longer? Um, and like, how do I even write about this without putting myself in trouble again. Like, I feel like inscrutability is like a really powerful method in that way when you, when you have to write around or dissect how you feel in like terms that you can no longer use. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's, that's me going on. Uh, <laughs> but Thank you. yeah. Thank you both for sharing. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Maybe one more question? Yeah. Hey, um, you about the cards. What are the other things, like the DSM, yes. testimony, tapestry, other things? Yeah, so the cards are one of five pieces. Um, the other four pieces, and they're on the table back there, so you can leave them and look at them. One is a, a, a hacked mock DSM, um, Asian American edition. So does everyone here know what the DSM is? The Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's the psychiatric Bible um, that kind of lays out what counts as a mental illness and diagnosis and treatment. And so we decided that we would make an Asian American one because that doesn't exist. Um, then we decided to hack it because if there was an Asian American one, it would be shitty and we'd have to hack it and fix it. And so we hacked it um, as if we tore all the pages out and put new ones in with artists and writers and scholars mm -hmm. and not psychiatrists or psychologists <clears throat> necessarily. Um, and then you get very different entries, very different ways of understanding what counts as wellness, what counts as unwellness, and, and even suggestions for what practices um, to treat from the, in the community. And so that's one piece. Uh, lot, there's essays, visual work in there, some fiction. And then um, the Testimonial Tapestry is a community piece where we uh, had people sub open call submit um, very short pieces of writing witnessing their own kind of suffering. And it was kind of stitched together into a large, it's, supposed to be like a quilt, even though it's, it's paper, um, as a way to kind of try to capture, it's, it's a very large piece, um, the overwhelming quality of our collective wounds, and you kind of put them all together. Another piece is um, a stack of handwritten daughter to mother letters to try, some of you are like, oh, I said that. <laughs> so you get it, uh, <laughs> as a way to capture intimacies and violence in families. Um, and then the last one is a pamphlet on postpartum depression, which is near and dear to my heart, where we took a standard info brochure, those brochures they give out at doctor's offices that you throw away because they're useless. Um, and so we took one of those and said, what if we annotated it? What if we redacted it? What if we rewrote definitions of what postpartum depression is? And we had um, mothers of color, women of color um, who have experienced different various um, you know, suffering related to 
postpartum issues, actually annotate it and write in there what their experiences look like, what their symptoms actually look like, ways they thought about treatment, um, and how it shifts our understanding of motherhood to have them write their stories in there instead of having a clinical kind of brochure. Did I cover all the pieces? Is that it? Okay. Yeah. Um, some people, we, we call it open emergency, it's in a box, I forgot to bring it up here, it's a cardboard box that has a big sticker, it says open an emergency, so the idea is you open it in an emergency. Some people have started calling it a kit, um, like an emergency kit or a mental health kit, um, and I like that, I like thinking of it as something you go to when um, you feel like you need to, and it kind of offers different things at different moments. Okay, wrap up? Okay, so yeah, thank you everybody for Thanks coming for and coming for participating so, um, so much. And thank you yeah. to the writers and speakers.